welcome to Sunday morning's meditation service. And we welcome all the people that are on live stream um, participating in this service. Meditation is you know, so important all the time so that you start your day in centered in spirit and move that day with that slowness, that connection, that helps you bring something pleasant to the day instead of something like fire to the day. Which fire is good in its own way, but not necessarily moving us along. So we're going to open with a, a chant and um, just relax and I'll go like that when you're to sing and um, feel relaxed. Be sure you're comfortable. All right. Go.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all of you that are watching on live stream. Yesterday afternoon, <clears throat> Norma came up to me and said, something's gone haywire on my laptop. I got this big flashing notice saying not to turn off my computer or anything, but immediately call this number. So uh, I wanted to uh, help her and, and get through it as quickly as I could. I had set aside that time to go over some of the details for the talk I would give today. Uh, and so I called the number. And uh, this gentleman answered, saying his name was Sam Gibbons, and that he's an FBI uh, computer crime, he's part of the FBI computer crime task force. And then he goes, uh, and he said, uh, your computer's been hacked, and uh, some people have gotten information off your computer. I'm going to have to go into your computer and uh, find out who it is and what it is, and I have to get them removed from that, and then I have to contact the FCC to make sure they're aware of the fact that this has happened and who did it. I spent two hours talking to this guy while I had the computer on in front of me, going through all this stuff, and he's showing me uh, the different thing, but in the meantime, he's uh, unbeknownst to me. He's extracting information from me. He's saying, "Do you, your wife, have credit cards that the number begins with four? Uh, and I look at my credit card, and uh, I ask Norma. She's sitting there. They begin with four. He said, "Okay, I'm, I'm going to need the last four digits of those." Credit card. I had two. I have two debit cards. She has a debit card. I have a debit card. So, I give him the last four digits. He said because I have to contact your bank right now. I've got to contact the FCC and the bank, and I've got to tell them not to uh, give away, process any uh, purchases on these cards. So I'm, I'm going to, and he's showing me in the meantime, and he said, right now there are 39 people hacking your computer. 39 people, and uh, most of them are from China. Some of them are from, uh, you know, the Philippines. And uh, right now there's a purchase that's already been made by a China group uh, for something. It's a China pornography group. And I'm, my head is spinning because I don't know I don't know anything about computers, but he's, he's really pretty facile. He's bringing up all the, this list of characters with numbers next to them uh, and countries and all, all this stuff. And so we get to a place where he said, okay, I'm going to call the bank. What's the name of your bank? And he says, don't tell me over the phone. 
just uh, type it in on the computer now. So I type in the name of the bank. It's uh, the Elevations. And uh, those resulting center. So the first, the, the one red flag that got me said, I'm going to be calling your bank so that they can stop any payment that's going to be made on these purchases now. And up that point, he said, you have three purchases that have taken place. So he's going to call the bank. And then uh, he says, how? This was the one, this is when Norma jumped up. Norma actually was the one that set it off. She's sitting there and he said, uh, how much... Uh, how much is your debit card worth? How much is, is in your debit card that you could take out? I need that for the bank's information. And Norma goes, no, no, don't do this. I said, I, I don't know. He said, well, give me an approximation. I said, I, I, I actually don't know. I said, uh, uh, and while he was doing that, I said, you know what? I'll, I said, I'm going to call the bank. He said, well, you may not want to do that because they're still hacking in. They may be hacking your phone. <laughs> it's like this guy is presently hacking our lives. And uh, I said, no, I, I'm going to call the bank. But unfortunately, at that time, Elevation was already closed. They closed at noon on Saturday. And my, one, my cell phone is out. My cell phone is out. The... Uh, he was trying to get through to my cell phone, and uh, it's on the internet. It's on, you know, the Wi-Fi at my house. That's my cell phone. It works at the house because of that, but it was off. And then he was on the landline that I was talking on, and I said, "Well, I'm going to call." He said, "Well, you, well, you may be being hacked right now." And I said. No, no, I, I'll call the bank. I'll call the bank. And uh, then I took Norma's phone, and hers is still working on the Wi-Fi. And uh, before I did that, I looked at the back of the, the debit card, and he had asked me for the number to call the bank. He said, give me the 800 number on the back of the card. So I gave him the 800 number. But there's a number, another number on the back of the card that says, in emergencies, call this number. So that's the number I called because the bank, I couldn't get through on that number. And I got the credit card company, Visa. And so I stopped. I had to stop all payments on those cards while he was on the other phone. And then uh, I, I picked it up to talk to him, and he was gone. So... Anyway, when something like that happens, we have to be careful. Don't panic, but listen. I mean, if you listen and you tune in, eventually you pick up that something's just not right here. Um, and that's what we were about doing. Uh, we were listening, and I was trying to be as aware as I could but I'll, I want to tell you this. The scams have become way more sophisticated. This guy's accent was barely there, just barely had an accent at all. Uh, but Norma said, no, that, I heard a guy who's, who's Chinese on television yesterday. <laughs> this, this guy sounds just like him. So I... I said, I don't know. He sounded authentic, but he was very, very, uh, very sophisticated in the way he was dealing with it, saying, don't say that over the phone. Just type it in on the computer. And uh, so I'm just warning you now. It's not just the phone calls you get where they say uh, something, and then they say, well, dial this other number. That was pretty easily you know, recognizable that something scaled. Like they, they would say, uh, your account at uh, Amazon, someone has just purchased $350 on your account at Amazon. Um, well, 
that usually doesn't work for us because we don't have an account at Amazon and Norma will refuse us to use Amazon. Uh, but in any case, that's the way they did it. But this guy coming on saying, I'm with the FBI Computer Crime Task Force, and he spoke pretty clearly and he wasn't tripping over his words, just stay on your computer. Don't say anything on the phone that I don't ask you to tell me. And he went through this whole thing and I spent a lot of time going back and forth while he was slowly extracting information. Uh, and there must have been somebody standing by. And if they had found out, if he had received an amount of money on the debit card, <clears throat> that would have probably happened like that. Somebody right there would have gone through and uh, cleaned it out or bought something that up until that amount. I guess you have to be careful because if they go to try to do something over the amount that you've got on the debit card, I guess that red flags the, the visa people. Anyway, it was an interesting thing, but uh, with all my background in pausing and letting and listening deep, I think, and Norma as well, I think we managed to avoid uh, a real financial difficulty. I want to share something with you that most of you probably don't know. Oh, well, let me ask a question. How many of you here have been test pilots in the Air Force? Okay. Then uh, this will be news to you. Can we have this first PowerPoint, please? Captain Alan Bain, the U.S. Navy Apollo astronaut, said this, test pilots have a litmus test for evaluating problems. When something goes wrong, they ask, is this thing still flying? If the answer is yes, then there's no immediate danger, no need to overreact. That's an interesting thing. I guess they're trained and they ask that question instead of immediately rushing to try to fix something that seems to have gone wrong. Well, uh, when the manned moon flight Apollo 12 launched, it was only within a minute that it was hit with lightning. And of course, the astronauts aboard that aircraft saw the council before them just light up with orange warning lights and red lights and buzzes going off. And, uh, but these were, these are ex test pilots. And instead of panicking and jumping to the first thing that they thought might be wrong, they, uh, they stopped and asked the question, is this thing still flying? Flying. <laughs> oh, it's not doing this. So, and is it headed in the right direction toward the moon? Uh, and it was. And so, in a peaceful, organized fashion, they looked at everything that was flashing and they started in a peaceful manner to deal with each one of these things that were signaling real trouble. And then they slowly watched, as they were doing this, the lights go out. And then they were on their, their way, on their mission, uh, without having panicked. Uh, I think that's a good illustration for all of us about uh, panicking over something that takes place. And I know this is true from the years that I did general counseling uh, for the church, that people tended to, to immediately rush to try to deal with some threat that appeared in their experience. And sometimes it was a physical threat. Sometimes it was a financial threat. Sometimes it was a relationship threat. Uh, I'll... Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples about situations in which you're threatened 
um, I had a gentleman who was a member of the church call up and just panicked, on tear, crying. And he said, I have to come in, I have to talk to you. I don't know what's happening in my life. And I said, okay, 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 come on in, come on in. Um, so he came in and he said, my, the, the lady I'm engaged to for a year and a half has just, she's moved out two weeks ago and I can't even get in contact with her. She moved in with her mother and she won't talk to me, won't do anything. And for two weeks I've been trying to contact her in every possible way, but nothing. She's, she's done. I don't even know what the problem could be. It, it can't be the fact that I, I decided, I told her, I, I don't want to attend the Catholic Church. She, she attends the Catholic Church, and her mother is a devout Catholic, does the rosary beads and everything. So, but I, can, can, is, is, could that be the problem? I don't know. He said, I, I can't talk to her, not a word, it's silent. So he said, I don't know what to do. And I, I said to him, call her best girlfriend and ask her out. Then she'll talk to you. So he did, and she did contact him back. And uh, they got squared away, and it wasn't too long after that, they got back together, and I think they were finally married. And he's not attending the Catholic Church. I'm not sure that was the issue. But I'll give you another example of opportunities in which you have to be careful not to panic. We were on a vacation with the family in our, our kind of dated VW van, and we had stopped at a gas station somewhere in Nevada. And while we were in the gas station, they served some kind of a breakfast there, and there were two, uh, you know, senior people sitting on a table having breakfast. And we had all the kids, they were, they were, you know, maybe five, six, and nine. We're sitting at the table, we thought we'd have a snack before we took off. We, we're on these trips, we're not, we don't have a destination, we're just deciding where, where we're gonna go, we'll find something and get involved, we'll camp there. So just the way we did these things in the summer, nothing planned, and we always had amazing experiences, not always great, like this one, these two people said, oh, where are you, where are you going? I said, well, we're, we're on vacation. We're just traveling through the state. We don't know. She said, oh, look, there's a great lake about 25 miles from here, and it's just beautiful. It's a gorgeous lake. It's very remote, but uh, if you go there, you'll have great swimming, and you can camp, and nobody will bother you. So I get the, I get the directions for the for the lake, and we finish up there, say goodbye to the wonderful couple, and I drive to the lake. Well, I can't find uh, a general, there's no road that leads into the lake. So I go over the, the wilderness that looks, it's not too, there's no big bushes or trees, but I drive the VW van in, and I'm going in toward the water. I get to a certain place, and I stop. It's, it's grassy and it's got twigs and it's got some bushes and some trees and stuff like that. And so we all get out, we're, we're gonna go swimming there. It wasn't the most ideal spot, but it was remote and it was a lake. And I sit down and I tell them, okay, before we do anything else, I wanna just gather some wood before it gets dark. Uh, so we'll have a fire that we'll be able to cook on and have marshmallows on. So the kids are in their bathing suits and they're going through gathering these little sticks. Oh, before that, we came upon this, you know, we, we walked and came upon this rocky area and along the rocks, we saw these little white skeletons of ha what had to be mice. And there was a lot of them all over these rocks. And, I, and it was just a curious thing to see that, but I didn't put anything together in my head. We went back, I had the kids get, gathering wood, and I'm putting uh, a 
some big rocks around to make a fire pit. And the dog, my dog Gashawi, who's right at my back, starts to growl. And then I hear, <laughs> it's a rattlesnake. And it's really close. But as soon as that snake started and my dog is growling, I hear the place light up with rattles in different directions. We are surrounded, we are literally surrounded by rattlesnakes. I shout to the kids, stop, wherever you are, just stop. Don't do anything, don't move. So I step up, I take the dog, I walk him back to the van. There's a path right there. We're walking over grass, and there's no path, but I walk the dog back to the van. So then I walk the dog out to uh, Shad. I said, Shad, just walk with me. And I walk with him. I said, hold the dog. Then I get Sentisha, and I got Dell. I said, walk straight back, right along here, right back to the van and get in the van. And meantime, they can hear the rattlesnakes going. The place is alive with rattlesnakes. And so they walk back to the van, and as soon as I realize they're safe and they're in the van looking out the window, I take a branch that's nearby, and I reach in and I pick up this four-foot rattlesnake like this. He's on the end of the branch to show them. The place is covered with rattlesnakes. The most odd thing you've ever seen. I've got this rattlesnake on the branch. I toss him back in. I make my way to the van, and we, we get out of there. But I suspect you could have panicked. I mean, you could have said, everybody run to the van. I had to make sure that they weren't going to go step on a rattlesnake uh, before I, I let them, led them back into the van. And I think that comes with years of meditation. And, uh, and so I'm saying that sometimes, and too often, really, <clears throat> people will panic at things. I know this happens on a physical health level. And as soon as people in the Western culture here get some kind of a little pain in the stomach, a headache, they're off to rush to a doctor. I've never done that. Norma has never done that. We've raised our kids to never do that. People ask us, and they, and this, they feel odd when we get them the answer. They said, like they say, who's your doctor? I said, we don't have one. Never had one. Uh, we've had, we've gone to uh, Binder, who was used to be in this community, who was a uh, another alternative healing guy. Uh, we've gone to him on certain occasions, and we went to Charlie Cropley many, many, many years ago, when Shad had. Well, I, we didn't know then, but scarlet fever. Uh, and I guess it worked out through Charlie Cropley, but other than that, we don't have a doctor. And uh, so people have, I, I know what, what we're in. Our society is all about safety and comfort. And we're always being sold more insurance and we're always being uh, guided to do the safe thing, do the very safe thing. Uh, you should have a doctor that you go to. You should be able to do that and whatever. OK, I realize that that's not a big deal. But what I want to share with you, I will fully share with you next Sunday. But let me say this. We have to be, to, to evolve, we have to be extremely mindful of what we believe, of what we take in to believe. And that goes along with, you know, somebody conning you on the internet. Uh, you have to be mindful enough to know that maybe you don't want to just rush to judgment. You don't want to overreact. You don't want to panic.
panic. Because if you, if you are aware, and I'm sure you are, most of you have listened to a salesman trying to sell you something, he's always letting you know that there's a very sh small window of time for you to sign up for this. So you have to get in on it. Uh, you have to eschew that. If you're going to finally, no, don't say you are going to finally, we, the human race, is evolving. And uh, if you really had any, done any research into some of the masters uh, who have mastered life, in other words, how do you say, how do you tell who a master is? Well, it, you sense an, an aura of peace, usually, in the presence of a master. But then, if you listen to what they say, they mostly are, are talking about being aligned with this greater intelligence. And you, you can pick that up, being aligned with this greater intelligence. But we all have to get there, in other words, to evolve. Is it possible that we can finally shed this awareness of limitation completely? I mean, finally, shed the limitation of being motivated by fear. If you check yourself out, you probably find out that a lot of what you do is motivated by fear. And uh, I don't think that's what the creation is all about. And I will tell you what, if you ever read the stuff, the information about Edgar Cayce, you are, you are going to be blown away by the fact that there are dimensions of awareness we have not yet been able to enter. We keep thinking we have to enter each dimension of awareness with some kind of high-tech uh, machinery. But I'm saying that if we were aware of our ability, the ability of the mind, we would probably rise out of being motivated by fear and be more motivated by peace of mind and love and harmony. And I think we have to evolve to that. And I think maybe this pandemic, which has shut everybody down, uh, is going to help us get there, maybe and maybe not. And, but it's not even a matter of <clears throat> the collective intelligence getting us there. It's a matter of the individual. Each of us must become more keenly aware that with every pain or trauma, I'll just give you an example. Uh, whenever something comes up in my life physically, um, if I get a headache and it's with me for a while, I use this idea as not wanted, not necessary, not needed. It's not, it's not necessarily an affirmation. It's simply saying, whatever this is, with that, what I'm saying to the cosmos is, if there's something I need to know, let me know, because I'm doing the best I can. So this is not needed, not wanted, not necessary. This is. If there's a message, and people say when you get some kind of illness or some problem that happens in your life, there's a reason for it, and you have to learn what that reason is. And quite often, it's got some information that's going to expand you a little bit on your journey. So I'm not rejecting that, but I'm saying to the universe, uh, I'm doing what I can do. I'm, I don't see, I don't have any insight. I'm just saying, this is not needed, not wanted, not necessary. I don't want it, period. And I've talked my way through a lot of things that people would have gone to a doctor for. Here's the problem. You go to a doctor, and he's immediately looking for something, but he's operating from strictly the outside life form perception. 
And if the doctor says, yeah, I think there might be something about this or something about that, you already have corroboration. And so that strengthens the belief you have that something is wrong. Uh, I know that th this sounds a little bit foreign to people that have uh, grown up in a fairly safe environment and live a, a fairly safe life. Uh, my message isn't about this. I'm going to be on that message completely and totally. I will say to, to you things next Sunday that you will say first can't happen, never did happen, must, can't be possible. Okay, that's what I'll say next Sunday. But for now, I'm trying to just get to this place uh, because I was so rudely interrupted yesterday when I should have been putting the details together for this talk that I'm out here winging it so what I'm really winging about is uh, pause. Take a holy pause when something physical, financial, difficult, relationship, whatever. Take a holy pause and tune in because that's where the guidance comes from. And we will call it intuition. It's intuitive. Uh, you can figure a lot of things out intellectually from where you're standing, what you're doing, but some things happen and it takes some time to just tune in and allow. Let me give you an example of why we should be doing that. Uh, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, this is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. On that day, when evening had come, he, the master, said to them, his disciples, let us go across the other side and let us go across now beyond the sea. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in a boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we are perishing? And this is the response. Can we have this on the PowerPoint? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? Again, we should be aware of the fact that if you don't take anything else away from today, take this away. The New Testament is not about the divinity of Jesus, one and only Son of God. The New Testament, if you allow yourself to look into it, is about the divinity of mankind, humanity. And so if it wasn't about the divinity of humanity, just see this. This is, this is what happens to you when you're enthralled with the idea of discovering what the truth of life is. Look at this and watch what it does to you when I say this. Would this master of life who could walk on water and raise the dead ever have said to those disciples, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? Is that not a reference to the fact that they have this divinity, that they could have calmed the sea themselves if they had only faith? And then when you get deeper into it, you realize as you look through the New Testament and the Old Testament and the book of Revelations that the sea represents the mind. And the mind is something that can be very calm or it can be very turbulent. And so what is it talking about here? It's talking about Jesus being asleep in a boat 2,000 years ago that they had to go and get in order to save themselves from sinking? Just look at that. Why is the Bible writer telling you that 
if the Bible is actually written for all people, for all times, and you begin to discover that the truths are universal and applicable to anyone, anytime, anywhere in his or her life, what is it saying? Not talking about one separate special Jesus, Son of God. It's talking about Christ in you. It's talking about the universal Christ consciousness that speaks to us all when we are still enough to listen, when we're not panicking, when we're not manipulating, not figuring, not stewing in our fears. And it speaks so that when something's going awry in our personal experience, that means the sea is turbulent. You feel like you, you're going to be swamped. You could drown, you panic. But in panic, you cut yourself off from that refined awareness, that intuitive awareness that is there to guide and lead. Of course, it takes some faith to do that. Our faith, for the most part, too often, goes into the threat or the problem. We have real faith in that. And if we don't have enough faith in it, you can be sure that the people that write these advertising things for the television, they want to show you fields of wheat blowing. They want to show the, the white cotton fluffs coming out of the big trees, coming down. They want to show you that to say it's allergy season. We've got some medication for you. And you see how we are conditioned. And believe me, I'm not saying it's easy to counter the conditioning, the limited conditioning that we're still operating in. Because if you look at the television, most of the advertisements, at least when I don't watch television that often, but it seems to me I watch occasionally uh, a program that has news on it uh, or a movie. It seems to me most of the advertisement is from the pharmaceutical companies still trying to sell. Gee, don't they have enough money yet? I mean, how much money are they making on the vaccines and the booster shots and the booster shots and the booster shots that will never pass away? Uh, here's what's going to happen. Yes, they may finally get to a place where they can stop COVID. But unless it stops in the minds of humanity, they will always be there. Because that which we fear comes upon us. And so I'm going to talk exclusively about that on Sunday. I'm way off this thing here. Uh, I have one other thing I think I need to share. Uh, I think it's this. I, I want to let you know that I want to get off this Christ thing. Just, just let me have this next PowerPoint, please. This is from Eckhart Tolle in The Stillness Speaks. In you, as in each human being, there is a dimension of consciousness far deeper than thought. It is the very essence of who you are. We may call it presence, awareness, the unconditioned consciousness. In the ancient teachings, it is the Christ within or your Buddha nature. So Eckhart Tolle, who is very familiar with his Buddha nature, is relating these things in Stillness Speaks. Uh, but they are, these are not new concepts. This is not a new concept. It is an eternal concept from almost the beginning of time, but since we don't have anything written back that far, since the beginning of writing, there have been those who have taken to task the thinking process of human experience and have stepped somehow beyond it and have tried to relate that to their fellow people. 
So I guess the thing about waking up the Christ in the boat is that boat is the mind, it's us, it's on the water. The mind can be thrown this way and that way. If you panic and believe you're going to sink, you probably will not take an affirmation. You will not take a thought that might bring you closer to that state of being, feeling okay. This, this craft is still flying. I'm really okay. I don't have to run and try to do something. Let me just wait it out. Let me take some water. Let me be still. Let me see. And maybe you'll discover that some things will, just like the lights on that council in that Apollo 12, will start to go out. So I guess what I'm saying is instead of pressing the panic button, press the pause. Learn to press the pause and tune in. All right, we'll meditate together. Uh, start by listening to our bowls. I'll give you a, a thought that you can hold on to when we enter the silence. And that thought is, <clears throat> I am is the name of God <coughs> given to Moses. I am in you, you are in me. I am the truth, I am the life, I am the way. I am the way of true life. Be still and know that I am God. I am in you, you are in me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I am the way of true life. Be still and know that I am God.
as we go forth from this meditation to those places we occupy in time and space, let us go forth with a greater determination to practice faith. For this opportunity in every moment, let us give thanks. And to this, we say, Amen. This has been an interesting day for me as well. I can tell you because the time has just fled. I was in my office. We got in about uh, 20 minutes to 7 this morning. And I always check a few things out, believe it or not. Uh, I always, this sounds crazy. Are you ready for more crazy? I check out the uh, perfume atomizers in the ladies' room and the men's room to make sure they're functioning. It's just something I do because we did have an occasion where the, the ladies' room went really bad one Sunday morning and got a lot of feedback from. So... I do that, and if, if the canisters are empty, I, I replace them. And so today, I got in at 20 to 7, and I had, we had the sententious two dogs with us. And I got to do a couple of things, and I said, well, I, I don't put on my, my guru costume. And none of you are taking it for serious anyway, so I don't know why I do it. But I didn't put it on. I just stayed in my jeans and my shirt. And I'm going through doing some things for the dogs. And then, but I'm thinking, I've got all this time. And so I, I go to the bathroom and check out. I have to change a canister or two and batteries in one of the atomizers. And uh, I get back to my office. It's half past eight already. I don't have my clothes on or anything. And... Uh, and now, just now, I thought we had way more time. And now I'm just wasting time telling you that time is fleeting. <laughs> I'm gonna, I better take the offering because, you know, who knows? <laughs> Come on, please. Come on down. Take our offerings, you know, bring it to mind. You guys watching on live stream, why don't you show up? Love to have you here. You know, you can witness the crazy up close. You don't want to miss next Sunday. You know what? Next Sunday, I'm going to do something extraordinary that can only oh, be... This Sunday, you've got Andy Lennox. That's right. I've got Andy Lennox at the second service, and I'm doing a dialogue with him, actually an interview of sorts. He's Ukraine, uh, and uh, he's been back there many times. He spent three years back there. Well, he was back there three years ago, but he was in the Peace Corps for over a year in Ukraine recently, and he's got relatives back there. So we're going to talk about the situation having to do with the Ukraine at the second service. About three or like 12 people every day in Ukraine. So he has the absolute truth of what's going on. OK. We need money to continue this kind of craziness. So be generous, you people online. Be super generous. Send something in. If you're just sitting there having coffee and tea, and you never send anything in, here's the day to make up your mind. You know what? I'm going to support the craziness that goes on there. So bring that financial gift to mind, and let's bless it with this offering prayer. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive because I give. And so it is. May the blessings of God rest upon you. May God's peace abide in you. May God's
All right. I want to thank you all for showing up, bravely showing up. And we have really a great table full of, you know, goodies in the fellowship hall. You can partake of that if you want to hang around and show up for the interview with Andy Lennick. We'd love to have you. Have a beautiful day. Looks like a beautiful day showing up out there. <laughs>